Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here. No stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Coffee. Without it, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We'd all be still living in Europe in mud huts. Here in Laredo, we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 4501 McPherson, the best coffee on the planet. If you can't get to Laredo, you can order from the Organic Man Coffee Trike dot shop. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Tusk1157 asked me about this next person. I had heard of her and her abilities, but I'd never really looked into it until he suggested. Even though part of my family comes from Germany back in 1895, no one in our family spoke German. Uh, they were in the U.S., and they decided they are going to speak English from then on. I am going to butcher some of these words and names as I venture through this show. If you're in Germany listening, sorry, I have a hard enough time with English without trying to speak German. If you don't speak German, just pretend like I'm pronouncing them correctly, because you probably don't know how it's supposed to sound. Anyway, that's that's how the show goes. Maria Orsich, uh, sometimes known as Maria Orsic, and a few other names, was born October 31st, 1895, in Vienna, Austria. Her father, Tomislav Orsic, was born in Zagreb, Croatia. Her mother, Sabine, was German. At a young age, Maria studied ballet and languages. Apparently, she spoke several and was able to read even more. A very little else is known about her early years. At some point in her life, she began to receive information through telepathy. Uh, she became what's known as a trans medium. Uh, they go into a trance and they channel other people. I wonder if people born on certain dates develop their abilities uh, due to the veil uh, being thin, or is it growing up with a birthday on Halloween, uh, they just turn in that direction. In Australia, back in the early 1900s, kids didn't go trick-or-treating and dress up and go knocking on doors asking for candy. Uh, people in that country celebrated Ellerselen, uh, which means All Souls Day. Uh, this is a day to think about loved ones that have passed away. Uh, people often vimit, visit the cemetery and they light candles in remembrance of their passed on relatives. Ellerselen is what is known as a silent holiday, which means no dancing or loud music is allowed in public places. Our version of Halloween is a lot more fun. Maria grew up, but not much was recorded about her or those in charge made sure it went missing. Now, there were some websites that I did visit that were all written in German, so I have no idea what they were saying, and when I hit the translate button, nothing happened. So, I couldn't find anything about her early life. In Vienna's Schopenhauer Cafe in 1917, she was about 22 at the time, occultist Karl Haushofer, a Baron Rudolf von Scheptendorf, and World War I ace pilot Luther Wise, who was also a bishop of a secret societius templi marxioni, or the inheritors of the Knights Templar. Along with these three men was Maria Orsic. 
The Great War was still on, and these folks were looking for some kind of a distraction from all the bad news. They had all studied the Golden Dawn, its teachings, rituals, and in particular its understanding of Asian secret societies and lodges in some depth. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, more commonly known simply as the Golden Dawn, was a secret society devoted to the study and the practice of occult hermeticism and metaphysics during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Known as a magic order, the Golden Dawn was active in Great Britain and focused its practices on thurgy and spiritual development. A thurgy describes the practice of rituals, sometimes seen as magic in nature, performed with the intention of invoking the action or evoking the presence of one or more deities. Many present-day concepts of ritual and magic, such as Wicca and Thelema, are inspired by the Golden Dawn which became one of the largest single influences on 20th century Western occultism. In the mid-19th century, people were looking into unexplained things. Magic, communicating with dead, and things like that. Soon, folks were trying to contact beings from other worlds. This was mostly reserved for the rich, since they didn't have to worry about things like earning a living. A lot of their research subjects were coming from poor families. Now this led to a mix between the two classes. Anytime rumors of someone with psychic powers was heard about, the paranormal societies would seek them out to see if they really could do what was claimed. Now this did lead to a lot of scam artists trying to convince the researchers they were legitimate so they could bilk them of their money. Uh, too many con artists made it hard to find real psychics. Uh, sometime in the 1880s, a collection of coded papers called the Cipher Manuscripts fell into the hands of Adolphus Woodford, a Freemason. Woodford looked at the pages, and he decided they weren't of any interest. But he passed them on to a fellow Freemason, William Westcott. Westcott was able to decipher the pages, and he found something worth looking into. 1887, Westcott managed to decode the papers, and he found them filled with teachings from the Hermetic Kabbalah and other occult mystical practices. Hermetic Kabbalah is an esoteric tradition involving mysticism and the occult. It is the underlying philosophy and framework for magical societies such as the Golden Dawn, a Thelemic order, mystical religious societies such as the Builders of the Aditum, and the Fellowship of the Rosy Cross, also known as Rosicrucians, and it is the precursor to neo-pagan, Wiccan, and New Age movements. Westcott, sensing the material potential, enlisted two other Freemasons, Samuel Mathers and William Woodman, to help him turn the written teachings into a fully realized system of thought. Uh, some of y'all are going to assume that the Masons did this as some evil plot to take over the world. Uh, Masons tend to think outside the box, and uh, that's the kind of person who would not only look into spiritism, but have the time to do so. The only people Westcott knew who thought along the same lines as him were fellow Masons. So, I can't say for sure that that's what they were doing or not. I'll let you all decide. A German countess and Rosicrucian Anna Spengel was able to contact entities called the Secret Chiefs, the spirits who knew the truths of the cosmos and would act as transcendental leaders of the Golden Dawn movement, guiding practitioners in the secrets of alchemy and witchcraft. By 1890, the Order of the Golden Dawn was in its golden age. Uh, with well over a hundred members. 
prominent figures such as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Bram Stoker. Y.B. Yeats were members in temples such as the Isis Urania Temple in London and the Amun Ra Temple in Edinburgh were popular spots for curious Victorians. One famous as well as infamous member was Alistair Crowley, who would use his experiences in the order to become an infamous occultist funding the religion of Thelema in the 1900s. Sebettendorf and Hassenhofer were reasoned reasoned, seasoned travelers who had been deeply inspired by the teachings and the stories coming out of India and Tibet. Karl Hassenhofer had formed relations with the Tibetan Yellow Hats, one of Asia's most powerful secret societies during the First World War. The Galug sect in Tibet. Galug means good discipline. They emphasized strict observation of the prospects of Buddhism. The monks of this school wore yellow hats, so they were known as the Yellow Sect or the Yellow Hats. Contact between Hoshenhofer and the Yellow Hats resulted in the establishment of a Tibetan colony in Germany in the 1920s. The four young people at the cafe in 1917 wanted to discover something about the Knights Templar's hidden revolutionary books as well as the secret society Die Herren vom Schwarzenstein or the Lords of the Black Stone uh, during the rendezvous in Vienna. A prelate or bishop Garnet was a member of the Knights Templar's inheritors, the only authentic Templar order. They are descended from the 1307 Templars who passed down their secrets from father to son until today. At the end of the Great War, or the war to end all wars, the Austrian Empire had been dissolved. Someone had to be made to pay back those enormous loans taken out to pay for all that shooting and killing, so Germany was made the scapegoat. The winners not the international banks, but the countries who came out on top, got together and they divided up Europe, rewriting the maps and creating new and unworkable countries. France, Britain, and the U.S. received a majority of the benefits, along with those bankers. Japan was handed over control of all German colonies in their area. A lot of people didn't know that Japan was on the U.S.'s side during the first war, the first big war. Uh, the uh, Italians, Italy, they were left out of receiving any of these benefits, even though they were also on the winning side. This act of ignorance is what led to Mussolini taking over the country, and that led to the outbreak of World War II. Post-war Germany was a huge mess. Thousands of people were out of work. Their economy was in shambles. People were looking for a savior who would lift them up from the depths. Anyone who promised to make life better was able to develop followers. Hitler was successful because he made the people of Germany feel as if they weren't failures. It wasn't their fault Germany had lost the Great War. It was someone else. Let's insert some other group of people that we can lay the blame on. Not saying you're at fault. I'm just saying you're going to take the blame for it. Now, this was the, the precursor to Germany uh, falling under the Nazis. Maria quickly became involved in the post-World War I German national movement, whose major purpose was to merge Austria and Germany, uh, creating one country out of the two. Maria married in 1919 and relocated to Munich with her fiancé. Uh, she became acquainted with the Thule Gesellschaft in Munich, 
The Thule Society, originally a study group of Germanic antiquity, antiquity, was a German occultist group founded in Munich shortly after World War I. They were named after a mythical northern country in a Greek uh, legends. Maria liked what she had seen, so she formed her own group, the Aldisch, yeah, Aldoisch Gesellschaft for Metaphysics. Like I said, I was going to butcher these words. Also known as the Vril Society. The group were all young ladies who, among other things, were opposed to an emerging trend of women having short hair. Maria and fellow member Trot A had very long hair that they wore in something called, it was an oversized ponytail that was better known as a horse's tail. A Trot A's name comes up a lot in the documents that I was reading while I was doing the research, but I couldn't find anything more about her other than she was a member with really long brown hair. And she was a pilot. Uh, there are dozens of photographs of her, but nothing in the way of a biography or family history. Uh, like I said, maybe it was one of those uh, websites I visited that was in German, and uh, therefore I couldn't know what was being said. Hey, if any of y'all out there know, send me a, an email. In 1871, Sir Edward Bulwer Lytton published a novel entitled Vril, The Power of the Coming Race, about a subterranean civilization able to utilize the powerful force of the Earth's energy that was called Vril. This energy could be used for good or bad, to heal or to destroy. The novel was a huge success in its time, and it's credited with the rise in popularity of science fiction. It's rarely read today because uh, Lighten's prose were incompatible with modern taste. If you've ever read really old novels, they're a little hard on the brain because the way they used to talk is compared to the way we do it today. I imagine if I was to go back in time, say, to the 1800s, they'd probably think I spoke weird, which I do. In the book, the Vril Ya was a race of beings who lived underground and had telepathic powers. They also had highly advanced technology, and they were able to do incredible amounts of damage simply by using Vril power in the form of a wand. The superior ancient race that had control of Vril power were running out of habitable space underground and they wanted to move up to the surface. Uh, since many people at the time believed in the possibility of an antediluvian race, that's pre-Atlantean, uh, there were people who accepted the coming race as fact instead of just a work of fiction. It was a popularity of this 1870 book that helped propel the idea of the Vril Society into the realm of reality. That may have been why they started using that name instead of their original one. Much of the Vril Society's work happened before World War II, with the Society's activity tapering off once Germany had lost the war. Originally connected to the secret societies such as the Thule Society and other similar societies tied to Nazi occultism, the Vril Society quickly became the stuff of legends among those who heard of the super technology associated with this mysterious sect. The members of the Vril Society never cut their hair, letting it get as long as it could. Some had hair hanging down past their knees. The women said that this hair was their antenna. It was used to help contact other beings in the universe and receive communications from Aryan aliens living in Alpha Centauri in the Aldebaran system. These aliens had visited Earth and settled in Samaria, 
and the word vril was formed from the ancient Sumerian word vril il, uh, like God or God-like. A second medium, known only as Sigrun, a name idiomatically, <laughs> yeah, a name related to Sigrun, the Valkyrie, one of Wutan's nine daughters in Norse legend. A North mythology, the Valkyrie, chooser, chooser of the slain, is one of the host of female figures who guide souls of the dead to the god Odin, or in Germany, he's known as Woden, at his hall, Valhalla. For unknown reasons, Woden was given his own day of the week. It was called Woden's Day, and with the devolvement of the word, it became Wednesday. Now, that's why Wednesday is spelled weird. Wednesday. Day. It's Woden's Day. Why do we have a name, name, uh, a name of a week for a German or Norse god? A Sigrun is another member of the Vril Society that is mentioned a lot, yet there's no writings about her. Either she wasn't cool enough to have her own websites, or everything is in German and I couldn't read it. In the movie Apocalypse Now, uh, Colonel Bill Kilgore, played by Robert Duvall, when they're attacking a VC village, the ho helicopters are coming in playing Ride of the Valkyries, which was written by Richard Wagner. I know it's pronounced Wagner, but it's spelled with a W, so... I pronounce it Wagner. It's like Warner Von Braun. Uh, I have heard it pronounced Werner, but it's got a W in it. Maria's hair was blonde while Trot's was brown. <laughs> I'm trying that again. Maria's hair was blonde while Trot's was brown. They wore the hair in the long horse tails, which was rather unusual hairdo at the time. Uh, this became the distinguishing feature of all the women who joined Vril, and it lasted until around May 1945. The women rarely, rarely wore their hair and horsetails while in public. Vril members wore a disc that represented the two mediums, Maria Orsic, who also went by Marija Ori, and Sigrun as a means of identification. 1919, in a small forest lodge outside Berktisch Garden, the Vril Circle met with other groups to explore a possible voyage to Aldebaran uh, to meet with the aliens by building huge flying disks. Maria had received technical data from a development of a flying aircraft via medium telepathy in a secret German Templar script a language she didn't know and few others could even read. She said these telepathic messages originated in Aldebaran, as she was channeling an alien and writing in an unknown language. As she had brought two stacks of papers with her to this meeting. One was written in Templar script and the other was in an unknown form of writing. Members who had joined them got busy trying to decipher these papers. The Pan-Babylonianists, which is a Thule Society group that included Hugo Winkler and Peter Jensen, had visited far-off countries in their quest for unknown and possibly forbidden knowledge, and they had studied the, the writings in these other countries. The papers written in this mysterious language turned out to be Old Sumerian, uh, the language of the ancient Babylonians. The Vril Sigrun assisted in translating the writings and deciphering the mental visions of circular flying machines. The Aldebarians perceived the economy disparity in earth cultures uh, fueled perpetual wars and conflict. They said that by balancing the disparity, they would bring peace to the world. So they set about trying to help Germany up out of their depression. 
The Aldebarians reasoned that by offering free energy technologies used to create affordable mass transportation devices, a new innovative generation of industries promoting prosperity and great peaceful interaction between the nations might result, diminishing all wars forever. Uh, such a plan resonated with members of both the Thule and the Vril societies and their dream for a clean and free technology-based uh, power source on alternative sciences harnessing the Vril energy. Maria Orsic wrote to other people all over the planet who were looking into similar endeavors. One of these people was Nikolai Tesla. Tesla was interested in communicating with beings on other planets. He was also trying to create free energy. Now, this led to both of them being scrutinized by their respective policing agencies. Maria was constantly being investigated by the Gestapo, and Tesla was always being investigated by the FBI. While in a state of trance, Maria received technical information and directions on how to construct a flying disc. Detailed plans and flying disc designs were recovered among Tesla's files. What happened to all of Tesla's papers? When he died, everything was seized by the Office of Alien Property. This is odd since Tesla had become a naturalized citizen of the U.S. in July of 1891. So what did the Office of Alien Property have to do with his stuff? Nobody knows. In order to interpret Maria's designs, her father got her in touch with Dr. Otto Schumann. The concept of other science, sometimes known as alternative science or hidden science, was developing. It took three years for the flying machine project to start taking shape due to financial challenges. By 1922, parts of the machine were arriving, paid for by Thule and Vril from diverse industrial sources. Now, I guess this means that they had invested in some manufacturing and they were getting their dividends that they were using to build a flying saucer with. Maria stayed in contact with Dr. Schumann, uh, handing over new information that eventually led to the construction of a flying disc that was able to fly for 55 minutes and at one point it reached a speed of 186 miles an hour. At the time, the fastest plane was the British Supermarine Sea Lion II, which was able to go 145 miles an hour, but for a very short distance. Maria Orsic visited Rudolf Hess in Munich in late November 1924. Uh, together with Rudolf van Sebzepatendorf, the founder of the Thule Society, uh, Dietrich Eckert had died the year before, and Sebattendorf wished to contact him. Eckert was a member of the Thule Society when he died. Rudolf Hess was the German politi politician and a leading member of the Nazi Party in Germany. He was appointed Deputy Führer to Adolf Hitler in 1933. Hess held that position until 1941 when his life took on a strange direction all of its own. I might have to do a show about Hess someday. Uh, Sebettendorf and other Thule members clasped hands around a black draped table in order to make contact with Eckert. Maria Orsic eyes were rolled back and they were only showing the whites. And she was leaning backwards in her chair. Sebettendorf thought that she must be in contact with Eckert, and when his voice came out of her mouth, he knew that she was in contact with the dead man. Eckert stated that he was obligated to allow another person's voice to get through with critical message. The next voice was that of a sumai, 
inhabitants of a faraway world orbiting the star Aldebaran in the Taurus constellation. The Sumai were a humanoid race that briefly invaded Earth 500 million years ago, according to this voice. They erected the ruins of ancient Larsa, Surapak, and Nepal in Iraq. There are some ancient structures in Iraq that scientists try to write off as having been built by the folks living there, even though way back then they didn't have the technological know-how or the manpower to do it. The ancestors of the Aryan race were those who survived the great flood of Utnapishtim. That's how it's spelled. <laughs> or, as they knew it, or as we know it, uh, the great flood of Noah's time. The Aryan race is an idea that was formed in the 19th and 20th centuries. The term Aryan comes from the Rig Veda and is the name of an ancient group of people in ancient Persia and India. Uh, they spoke Indo-European language. It has been used to describe people of Iran and India, but there was no record of Aryans in European history. Later it was used for Germanic people because the new ideas about the Aryans. Rig Veda is an ancient Indian religious book. It is counted as one of the four sacred Hindu writings, which are all called Vedas. It is the world's oldest religious writings. It is also one of the oldest writings in Sanskrit language. Rig Veda is very important to Hindus, especially those in India and Nepal. Its words are said during prayers and religious gatherings. The book dates back to 3,700 years ago. Now, the Bible is only 3,500 years old. Maria wrote numerous lines of strange-looking marks while remaining in a trance, what we would call remote writing. These were Sumerian characters, the language of the founders of early Babylonian society. According to the Vril Society, Aldebaran's solar system, which is 68 light-years away from Earth, that's 408 trillion miles, and the realm of Sumerian consisted of two habitable planets orbiting their sun. Oh, it was the realm of Sumeron. It had two habitable planets. The people of this solar system are separated into three groups. There were the masters, the white godlike humans, uh, supposedly called Aryans, and then two other races. Uh, these arose as a result of climate variations on individual planets and were the outcome of the godlike people's degeneration. These mutants developed spiritually at a slower rate than the godlike people. The more races were mingled together, the lower their spiritual development became. As a result, as the sun Aldebaran began to expand, they were no longer able to perform interplanetary travels like their forefathers had. The leaving their planet had become nearly impossible. As a result, the lower races, who were completely reliant on the masters, were evacuated in spaceships and sent to other habitable planets. Despite their differences, these two races were supposed to get along with each other, not meddling in each other's affairs, other than shipping them off planet. Uh, following the growth of the Aldebaran sun and the increasing heat that resulted from it, the master race, these white godlike beings, began colonizing other worlds comparable to the Earth 500 million years ago. They were supposed to have populated the planet Melona, also known as Maldek and Murdek, or Phaeton, by the Russians, which was in our solar system. It used to sit between Mars and Jupiter. That's where the asteroid belt is today. 
Mars was also inhabited by the Aldebarans, where the huge pyramid cities and the well-known Martian face photographed by the Viking mission in 1976 attest to the people's high degree of development. It was assumed that these godlike beings from Sumeron arrived on Earth for the first time around this period. Members of the Vril Society believed that the Aldebarians arrived in Mesopotamia when the Earth became more habitable and they were the Sumerians' a dominant caste. White godlike people were the name given to the Aldebarians. Now, furthermore, the Vril telepaths learned that the Sumerian language was not only identical to that of the Aldebarians, but it was also comparable to German, and the frequency of the two languages was nearly identical. Uh, German historians in the 1930s had a tendency to bend what they found in other people's historic documents. Uh, they would take what they liked and ignore anything that they didn't like, if it didn't fit into their agenda. Uh, kind of like some people do today when they want to tell the rest of us how to live. The Vril psychics began to supply drawings and blueprints of new and bizarre machines. Another machine they drew up was a time-traveling device. The Vril said these machines were to be used for the good of man and not world conquest. Well, the Nazis said they would do as the Vril said, but when's the last time any politician told the truth? The construction drawings and technical data received by the telepaths, regardless of where it may have come from, were so well illustrated the most incredible notion ever envisioned by man arose. They wanted to develop a vehicle to fly to other worlds, or maybe even other dimensions. As Germany moved towards anti-Semitism, any Jewish ideas were frowned upon. College professors began to lose their positions at universities. Their books were burned, and any theories they had were considered no longer valid. Folks like Einstein and John von Neumann were ignored in the world of physics. German physics became the new way of doing things. They went so far as to only read books that were written in German, ignoring anything in any other language. You could say they were following their science the science they chose to believe. Anyone who disagreed with what they were saying was ridiculed and not allowed to lecture in public. Now, does this sound like recent events? The SS were the Nazi special police force, founded in 1925 by Hitler as a personal bodyguard. The SS provided security forces including the Gestapo, and they administrated the concentration camps. There are few stories that say the SS was formed at the suggestions of the Frill Society or the Thalemic Society, or maybe even both. It could have been a suggestion of creating a special police force that turned into a bloodthirsty political party, or maybe the Vril weren't as uh, peace-loving as they claimed. When Hitler prohibited secret societies in 1941, the Vril Society registered themselves as a business named the Vril Propulsion Workshop. Now, this kind of makes me think of the jet propulsion laboratories from Jack Parsons and Company. He was also into some very bizarre things. In December 1943, Maria attended, together with Sigrun, a meeting held by Vril at the seaside resort of Kohlberg. The main purpose of this meeting was to deal with the Aldebaran project. The Vril mediums had received precise information regarding the habitable planets around the sun Aldebaran, and they were in the beginning stages of planning a trip there. This project was discussed again in January 1944 in a meeting between Hitler, Himmler, 
Uh, Dr. Schumann and Kunkel of the Vril Gesellschaft. It was decided that a, a flying craft called the Vril 7, a large capacity disc, 147 feet in diameter, would be sent through a dimensional channel independent of the speed of light to Aldebaran. The test flight almost ended in a disaster because after the flight of the Vril 7, it looked as if it had been flying for over a hundred years. Its outer skin looked aged and it had suffered damage in several places. According to the report, the first flight in the dimensional channel took place in the winter of 1944 with the craft tightly tethered to the ground. These problems they had would have to be addressed before the real trip to Aldebaran was made or the passengers would all die from old age before they got there. A Sigrin made frequent trips to the facility working on Vril 7 to oversee construction and the testing of the flying disc. A group of engineers approached her at the time with a request. They wanted to know if the Vril a Tybework engine could be adopted to one of their projects, a strategic bomber. Uh, they were abruptly told that no, the engine could not be used in the bomber, and so they went back to using their normal designs. Now, Sigrun was actually concerned that these people wanted to use a, one of her engines, as she said, to put on a bomber. Or maybe the thing just wouldn't fit. The Nazis had a reputation of not taking no for an answer. If they wanted it, they would have taken it anyway, regardless of what she may have said. Perhaps the engine just wasn't compatible with a normal airplane. Or maybe it wouldn't work in the Earth's atmosphere or something, but she told them no and they took that as the answer. Perhaps also, now Hitler did not really like modern technology. Uh, for some odd reason, he liked the older stuff. The jet engine was developed in 1934 in Germany. It was more efficient and it had fewer moving parts, but Hitler liked the propeller-driven planes, uh, so that's what they used right up until the last days of the war. By winter 1944, the Vril 7 was ready for its next test flight at the Brandenburg Test Grounds. Vril medium Sigrun not only supervised the construction of the Vril 7, but she was also its pilot. It is said that the Vril energy can repair the body's DNA, allowing one to revert to a healthier state of youth. The medium Sigrun was supposed to be 140 years old, yet she never aged. Now, things are possible when you can manipulate time or you can write your own story. In early March 1945, the Thule Society received a letter signed by Maria Orsich making reference to the trip Aldebaran. It seemed that some of the Vril group had already made the trip and they were living there already. The letter ended with, no one remains here. Uh, but nobody really knows if they were going to another planet or somewhere else. Maria Orsich disappeared in 1945. Her whereabouts is still unknown today. Along with her, many members of the Vril Society also disappeared. In March that same year, in a state of trance, she had received information about the coming fall of Nazi Germany before the end of 1945. Rudolf von Sebettendorf was the founder of the Thule Society, committed suicide by jumping into the Bosphorus. Well, that's what they tell us happened to him anyway. Now, these are the same folks who said that Hitler shot himself. Who can we believe these days? Many people believed that the Vril moved away to Aldebaran, but that was just a story being spread by someone. 
The real destination, they said, was the utopia that was being established in the Antarctic, New Swabenland. This was the secret Nazi base many high-ranking Nazi leaders escaped to at the end of the war. At the end of the war with Germany, over a hundred U-boats were missing with no record of their having been sunk. During the war, thousands of people disappeared without a trace. There was no way of determining who was who and looking at a pile of dead bodies. Even the supposed body of Adolf Hitler turned out to be that of a woman. One of the more interesting disappearances was that of General Kammler. Immediately after the end of World War II, the victorious powers began interrogating the elites of the National Socialist State, the Nazis. When the question came to the German V-weapons program, uh, jet fighters and underground armament factories, the name Hans Kammler was mentioned again and again. In the final phases of the war, SS Obergruppenführer, the head of the office of Unit C of the Economic Administration's main office of the SS, had been given uh, far-reaching abilities for the production and the use of any of the latest technology. As Allied soldiers looked through Nazi records, they found out that the SS had built a secret facility known as the Giant, near the Wenceslas Mine, close to the Czech border. A detail was sent to look into it. The soldiers found more defensive works around the Giant than the Nazis had built around Berlin. They also found over 60 scientists had been executed, so the Allies would be unable to question them. A Kemmler had one of two long-range bombers built by the Nazis that was able to fly as far as New York City without refueling. Him and the plane had vanished. Some say he flew to Spain, while others simply say he managed to escape capture somehow. A Kemmler had been working on the Nazi Bell, an anti-gravity device that just might be able to travel through time as well. The Vril Society had received plans for time travel device in the 1930s. This would have given the Nazis ample time to acquire these documents and see about making them into reality. Now, some people say they got the technology from India, from ancient writings. That also could be possible. Perhaps the two were combined to come up with the final result. During the occupation of Germany at the beginning of 1945, Americans discovered photographs of the Hanabu II and the Vril I craft as well as the Andromeda device, a 300-foot-long cigar-shaped craft in a secret archives of the SS. Their most precious find, of course, were the two prominent scientists, Victor Schauberger and Warner von Braun, who were taken to the United States under the Project Paperclip and put in charge of the space program. I always say the United States didn't beat the Russians to the moon. The U.S. Nazis beat the Russian Nazis to the moon because their scientists and our scientists were from the same background. Wonder what happened to Vril 2 through 6. There was no mention of it, just Vril 1 and Vril 7. An American air and space developer is reported to have confessed before he died. He said if the public ever learned that we had this technology for all of these years, they would never forgive us for keeping it a secret. President Eisenhower, without the Congress's knowledge, approved a massive funding for the construction of a research facility that was to operate based on Tesla's files. You know, the files that disappeared when he died? A Tesla had died in 1949 in New York, and the American government had confiscated all of his files and records immediately after his death. And they still won't let people look at him. 
A few years ago, the German science magazine, PM, wrote in a report at the end of World War II, Hitler had put out orders for the aircraft manufacturers to begin building flying saucers. According to PM, a prototype had actually flown, and there were 15 other prototypes in the works. Now, this would have been aside from the flight of the Vril 7. The magazine had quoted eyewitnesses that the UFO, with an iron cross, the symbol of the German army, was seen flying over the Thames in 1944. The Americans also had the vessel detected on their radar and thought of it as a potential danger, but they never mentioned it to anyone. Other reports have come out about some of the advanced technology conceived of and built by the Nazis even during the height of the war. The Nazis' successful development of a functioning disc craft during the war is now well documented. Virgil Armstrong, former CIA operative and former Green Beret, said the German flying machines during World War II could land and take off vertically and they could fly making right angle turns. They reached 1800 miles an hour and they were armed with cannons which could penetrate a shield four inches thick. They were just too late getting the flying discs into the air. In early 1943, the Nazis had embarked on the design of a cigar-shaped spacecraft that was to be built in a workshop in the Zeppelin factory. It was the Andromeda apparatus and was designed to transport several smaller spacecraft as a platform for interstellar flight, uh, kind of like an aircraft carrier. You send the big, shot, big ship across the ocean, and then you send the smaller craft to do whatever they're going to do. Other things have come to light that should convince anyone that the folks in charge didn't tell us the truth at the end of World War II. During the time I.G. Farben supported Hitler, their partner was Standard Oil, owned by John Rockefeller. It sounds like just a bit wrong for an American company to have a partner in Germany while the two countries are trying to kill each other. 1927, Standard Oil and IG Farben had founded a company named Standard IG Farben. They never dissolved their partnership. The alliance of Standard Oil with the Nazis wasn't well regarded by the U.S. government. Uh, gee, I wonder why. Above all, after the U.S. entered the war after Pearl Harbor. The U.S. declared war on Japan, which was Germany's ally, so Germany declared war on the U.S. Officials remembered an old law, trading with the enemy, and they opened formal investigations against Standard Oil. The accusation was that the company hid patents from the U.S. Navy and they were supplying fuel to German U-boats. John Rockefeller said he wasn't aware of that, but he pled no contest to charges of criminal conspiracy with the Nazis. March 1942, the Pentagon begged President Roosevelt to stop the investigation so they could protect war production and oil supply. Roosevelt agreed. The company paid a fine of $5,000, and they promised they would never do it again. At that time, $5,000 was a lot of money, but to a company like Standard Oil, that was a trip to the coffee shop. Ford Motor Company made our armaments to build vehicles. Uh, Ford Motor Company made armaments and built vehicles for the U.S. Army. While at the same time, they produced a German military vehicles for the Nazis. A Ford and Opel subsidiary of GM that was controlled by J.P. Morgan were the two largest car manufacturers in Germany for Hitler. No matter the winner, the globalist multinational corporations were instigating and profiting from both sides. 
During the war, the car companies established a reputation for themselves as the arsenal of democracy by transforming their production lines to make airplanes, tanks, and trucks for the armies in order to defeat Adolf Hitler. Their huge business interests in Nazi Germany led them to become the arsenal of fascism as well. Documents discovered in German and American archives show a much more complicated picture. American managers of both GM and Ford went along with the conversion of their German plants to make military vehicles for the U.S. government and for the Nazis at the same time. They were also resisting calls from Roosevelt administration asking them to step up production in their plants in the U.S., while at the same time they were stepping things up in Germany. When the U.S. Army liberated the Ford plants in Cologne and Berlin, they found destitute foreign workers confined behind barbed wire and company documents extolling the genius of the Fuhrer. According to reports filed by soldiers at the scene, a U.S. Army report by investigator Henry Schneider dated September 5, 1945, accused a German branch of Ford of serving as an arsenal of Nazism, at least for military vehicles, with the consent of the parent company in Dearborn. 1946, the Rockefeller Foundation paid $139 thousand dollars for the exclusive rights to the official public version report of the history of the Second World War, which concealed all the help provided by American bankers in financing and arming the Nazi war machine. They also made sure to keep from the public the truth behind Admiral Byrd's mission to the Antarctic immediately following World War II a secret that has lasted as long as the cover-up of events at Roswell. I'll get to that in just a second. It was also silent about the mystical and the occult ideology behind the Nazi regime, including the Vril-inspired free energy technology, which was rumored to have been later perfected at Area 51. The major donor to all of this was the Rockefeller's Standard Oil. Operation High Jump, officially titled the United States Navy Antarctic Development Program, 1946 to 1947, also known as Task Force 68, was the United States Navy operation to establish the Antarctic Research Base named Little America 4. The operation was organized by Rear Admiral Richard Bo Boyd, <laughs> Richard Byrd. <laughs> the operation was to last for about a year. 4,000 military troops from the U.S., Britain, and Australia military were sent along with a year uh, plan for mapping and photographing the Antarctic. After about a month, the expedition was canceled and the Navy pulled out and returned home. Several ships, planes, and their crews were missing. Stories of huge flying discs embellished with swastikas coming up from the ice and attacking the men were told, but people balked at listening. They didn't want to hear this. People had just been told that the United States had beat the Nazis. There couldn't possibly be Nazis in the Antarctic. So instead of listening to the witnesses, they listened to the people that were telling them what they wanted to hear. At the end of the war, Admiral Dernitz surrendered all German soldiers, airmen, and sailors. Well, the Nazis never surrendered. They either kept fighting, they skipped town, letting the people of Germany face the consequences for the death camps, or they committed suicide. Now, several U-boats continued sailing around in the southern hemisphere for months after the surrender was supposed to have taken place. Why would so many people go to such lengths to protect the failed Nazi takeover, as well as these big companies? Well, to begin with, big companies give big donations to their favorite political group. 
They also give big donations to their not favorite political group. They pay both sides. So, no matter who wins the election, they're both indebted to these big companies. People say that Kennedy won the 1960 election because he was being backed by the Mafia. Well, the Mafia was also paying Nixon. They gave him millions of dollars. That way, if Kennedy won, he owed them a favor, and if Nixon won, he also owed them a favor. The Standard Oil had zero reasons to allow people access to free energy. Their entire basis for making money was selling oil, not giving it away. Uh, just as J.P. Morgan had sabotaged Tesla, offering him a huge loan towards the Wardenclyffe project, as long as Tesla uh, sunk his own money into the project as well, and then Morgan refused to send the money that he had promised, thus bankrupting Tesla. Maria Orsich either left the planet en route to Aldebaran, or some planet close by, or maybe she was whisked away to the Antarctic to continue her research and development of flying disks and time machines. As she is listed as having married her fiancé, but there's no record of her ever having any kids. She may have become one of the thousands of nameless bodies found all over Europe at the end of the war, or she might still be alive. After all, if her cohort in building the flying disc could be 140 years old, why couldn't Maria be old as well and still alive? History isn't written by the victors. It's written by the people with the most money. The Vril Society has their own Facebook page. It's under the following address, which I'm going to have to read out because it's a long one. Their, their Facebook page is facebook.com backslash profile dot php question mark id equal sign one zero 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 six four three three eight five zero three seven five nine. Now, it's all in German, so I have no idea what they were saying, but it has Maria Orsich's photograph standing in front of a flying saucer as their head, uh, top space, whatever the heck they, what do you call that thing? The banner. Yeah, I'm having a, having a mental thing. It's getting too close to the end of the show and my brain wants to go somewhere and drink coffee. Uh, there's also a, Web, I mean, a Facebook page under the Vril Society. In fact, there are several, but most of these sites are listed as being private. You have to be a member in order to see what they have to say. And there's also several under the Vril Society that I have no idea what they're doing, and I think maybe they don't know either. They just used the name, and I guess they thought it sounded cool. I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. If you did, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your mother-in-law. They should be listening to the show. If you'd like to support the show, you know, send me a few bucks in some way, you can go to tpublic.com and order a t-shirt. Not this one. I got this one from the International Funeral Home Museum in Houston. But go to tpublic.com. You can find strange things with Chris James t-shirts coffee cups, grocery bags, you name it, they've got it. Or if you'd like to buy one of my books, you can find them on Amazon.com. Now, I'm not the only writer named Chris James at Amazon, so look for my books. Uh, the books you want to be looking for are the Laredo Paranormal Research Society. That's the history of our local ghost hunting team. There's a book called Fort McIntosh and the Paranormal. It's the history about Fort McIntosh, which is now the Laredo College. And there's some paranormal happenings out there as well. L uh, paranormal Laredo is a bunch of stories that I've gotten from people here in Laredo. I went as far north as the Columbia Bridge and as far south as San Ignacio, uh, simply because a lot of the people involved in both of those areas 
live in Laredo today. The last book you want to look for is more no paranormal stories, which I've gotten from my listeners. Uh, some are from South Africa. I've got a couple from Australia. If you want to buy a book, those are the books you want to look for. If you have a story that you'd like to see in print, something true, something that you know for a fact happened, not something you read in a book or heard on a radio show, you can send it to me at strangethings at arcanasa.com. Uh, send me as few or as many details as you can, and I'll put it into a readable format. I will send you the draft so you can okay what I write before I put it on paper. So, let me have your stories if you'd like to see them in print. I don't care where they're from. As long as they're true, I'll put them in my next book. Until next Saturday, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you coming to the tree? With a strong upper man, the same murder three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be. If we met at midnight in the hanging tree.